Okay, so in thinking <clears throat> about the relationship between archaeology and uh, different forms of historical fiction, novels, films, and TV, uh, Dan and I have come increasingly to the realization that empathy plays uh, a key role. Authors and filmmakers encourage, uh, <clears throat> encourage us to see through the eyes or to walk in the shoes of characters, allowing us to appreciate their beliefs, their motives, misunderstandings, <coughs> prejudice, prejudices, and actions. The role of empathy in archaeology has been recognised and discussed for some time, most recently in the con uh, context of phenomenology and emotions in archaeology. However, apart from agreeing that the subject's hard to tackle, uh, there's been very little consensus about what it involves and if and how it should be used. In our paper, we consider some recent insights into uh, empathy studies generally and explore the potential advantages and disadvantages of using it within archaeology and especially when deploying fictional or imagined uh, representations of the past. Now, a notable feature of uh, discussions about empathy, both within and beyond archaeology, uh, is the imprecise usage of terminology, leading to some significant uh, confusion. So it's therefore useful to start with some quick uh, definitions to clear the ground. Are we on this one? No, we're on this one. Oop, right. Here we go. So first of all, an anti-definition. Empathy is not the same as sympathy. Empathy involves the sharing of perspective or emotion, whereas sympathy does not. Hence, I might sympathise with someone's plight, feel compassion or pity for them, but not necessarily share or understand their predicament. Empathy involves taking the perspective of another person, not just feeling sorry for them. Now, the psychological and philosophical literature on empathy breaks it down into two broad uh, elements of, with some degree of, of overlap. They're labelled in various different ways, but they boil down to affective and cognitive empathy. Affective empathy involves the sharing or mirroring uh, of emotions, such as anguish or fear, whereas cognitive empathy involves a more conscious effort to take the perspective of someone else in order to experience, for example, uh, their tastes or their particular world views. Another, consider another type of empathy or related to those is so-called positional empathy, which assumes, for example, that by virtue of being a woman, one might have particular insight into the, into the experience of women in the past. On a logical level, we find this notion of privileged insight naive, although we also recognise that intuitively we feel as though we have special insight into areas of which we have personal experience, such as parenthood or loss. So we'll consider some of these uh, particular concerns uh, and others uh, about empathy in a moment. Now, a long-running run, critique of archaeology is that it's dehumanised the past, emphasising processes and things rather than social action, communities uh, and individuals. And amongst a range of responses uh, and solutions to that, there, there has been interest in the use of fictional and imagined narratives to get at the people of the past, their sensory experiences, and in particular underrepresented groups such as women or colonised uh, peoples, in order to develop critiques of existing narratives. Another reason for taking the perspective of people in the past is in order to help escape hindsight or, or, or a teleological approach so as to understand people's actions in the context in which they were made. Actions which seem, irra seem irrational with hindsight may make more sense if we understand them or seek to understand them from the perspective of past people. We also need to be able to evaluate other possibilities which never happened in order to understand the significance of those that did. Again, looking at the choices that people of the past faced from their own perspective that may help us to uh, uh, illuminate their, or elucidate uh, how things turned out the way they did. The tension here, as any novelist knows, is between what their characters know, or rather don't know, their partial view in relation to the world around them, and especially to the future, and what can only be known with the benefit of hindsight, such as the long-term consequences of actions, how thousands of individual actions <laughs> aggregate together uh, um, to create uh, sort of wider processes. And this reminds us that in order to understand the past, we always need to take multiple perspectives. And this, as we will see, is key to the use of empathy. That is, not substituting one present perspective for another past one, but holding the two in tension. So Dan and I are going to swap over. 
Um, the issues raised by and uh, objections to empathy um, can be roughly divided in, into ethical ones and epistemological ones. Much of the work on empathy, uh, both academic and popular, is concerned with the present. Uh, hence, how can empathy inform or or how might, might it better inform interpersonal relations and actions today? There's some discussion of the possibility of empathizing with a future self or future others, such as unborn grandchildren, um, but there is generally much less academic discussion of if and how we can empathize with people in the past. Most of the work in this area has concentrated on education and the teaching of history. Sarah Tarlow provides one of the more developed discussions of empathy in relation to her uh, work on emotion in archaeology. She broadly distinguishes, uh, again, two opposing approaches, again, labeled with a wide variety of terminology, but which boiled down to a biological or uh, universalist list position and a cultural or constructivist one. In its extreme form, the universalist position holds that emotions are biologically determined and universal across our species, um, regardless of any cultural factors. Now, clearly, this would make empathy much easier. Um, the con constructivist position holds that emotions are culturally determined and therefore variable between human societies, clearly less conducive to the concept of empathy. Um, Tarlow's own theoretical standpoint seems to come down on the constructivist side, and from this position, many have argued to the exclusion of empathy from the academic toolkit. Uh, as it requires some level of uh, universalist assumptions that we can't assume in light of observed or, uh, observed or observable variety in cultures. Um, we however do find it very difficult to accept a situation in which there would be no common ground between us and fellow humans, whether in the present or the past. This is not to be blind to culture factors, but simply that to argue that all emotions and uh, human experience generally is socially constructed is too extreme. Now this means that some form of empathy should be possible, as long as we are aware of the factors that impinge upon it. Indeed, ultimately, Tarlow also acknowledges that few scholars would maintain that universalism or constructivism are absolute positions, and therefore we might think of them as extremes uh, on a spectrum and discussion might therefore focus instead on, on where um, and uh, where on the spectrum and how these emotions occurred. <coughs> as well as questions about whether empathy is ep epistemologically sound, there are also questions about the ethics of empathy. In moral ethics, the two major issues discussed are the possibilities of two forms of bias, here and now bias and familiarity bias. These two empathic biases are widely recognized in the literature and are very relevant to uh, our archaeological discussion. Here and now bias means that we are more prone to empathize with people closer to us than further away. A recent example would be the debate around why people in the UK are more affected by terrorism in, Baghdad, uh, in Paris than in Baghdad. It raises significant questions uh, such as whether or not it becomes more difficult to empathize with people the further back in time we go, and whether, for example, someone in Guatemala uh, is better able to empathize with an archaic Mayan than with a Minoan. Um, now, very closely related is uh, f familiarity bias, uh, which is that we empathize more with people who are like us, um, as such as linked by family, culture, nationality, etc or with those with whom we feel some sense of familiarity, such as, as having written their own literature. This raises important issues which have led to the quest to some so, which have led some to question the morality of empathy. For example, are some groups more deserving of help simply because they are more like us? In relation to the past, the issue of familiarity, or at least assumed familiarity, might go some way to explain why we in England seem to be able to uh, more <coughs> to empathize more with Romans than with the Vikings or with the Greeks than with the Incas. As a result of these biases, scholars have questioned the moral value 
of empathy in relation to issues such as justice or charity. At the opposite extreme, empathy is critiqued <coughs> because it potentially clouds moral judgment, condoning acts of criminality or violence. That is, if we understand someone's motives, do we, uh, we may condone them. If we empathize with the perspective, do we automatically end up sympathizing with it? And a timely example would be Cameron's terrorist sympathizers. Um, both of these prob are problems with implementation of empathy rather than any inherent qualities, uh, as we will see in a, in a moment. Um, as these biases have also been discerned by archaeologists, and especially, very relevant today, uh, in relation to fictional or imagined accounts. Transform into Rob again. Marvellous. Right, so an ethical case has also been made uh, in archaeology and the humanities and social sciences more generally against empathy as a research tool. Post-colonial studies, for example, um, Spivak have argued um, that attempts to give voice to the other always end up imposing the voice of the author. Uh, and in the context of historical fiction, um, uh, Reinhard Birnbeck has recently argued along similar lines that the invention of subjects, however well meant the empath empathetic effort is, implies a certain disrespect for peoples of the past. And he equates this to an act of violence perpetrated by the present towards the past. And this resonates with the general argument in cultural studies that anthropology or the writing of the other is an act of colonialism uh, or appropriation. A problem with this reasoning, um, we feel, is that it, when taken to its logical conclusion, all attempts to take interest in or to try and understand another person become colonial. This position reflects the universalism versus constructivism debate. It paralyzes any attempt to engage with other people in the same way that absolute constructivism precludes any possibility of understanding the past. Thus, our attempts to understand and empathize with our partners, children, or with a friend in distress amount to an act of appropriation. As an absolute position, this excludes any form of understanding. It seems to us to hollow out the, the, the concept of empathy or colonialism. There are various res uh, responses then to, to Birnbeck's position. First, a number of scholars argue that we're already using empathy, and therefore, if we're already using it, we might as well at least recognize it and be explicit about it. Others concede that empathy must play some role in what we're doing, but they find it problematic and it's been rather swept under the carpet. Another response to the accusation of the present appropriating the past is to ask if archaeologists do not speak up for the people of the past, then who will? Now this gets us into a, a, a sort of a, a broader or slightly different debate perhaps about the, uh, uh, the role of uh, the authority of professional archaeologists as either gatekeepers uh, of the past or judges of the past. And here um, we'd, we'd follow the, uh, uh, the argument of um, uh, Mark Plusianic for the role of archaeologists as expert facilitators rather than the guardians or sole guardians of knowledge, which allows us to counter um, incorrect or undesirable interpretations of the past, racism and sexism and so on, um, but allows us, to, uh, and allows us to act as advocates for people of the past without necessarily putting our words into their mouths. We can also take inspiration from the work of Adrian and Mary Pretzelis. They argue that storytelling gives form and meaning to archaeological data, that stories must have political or pedagogical purpose as well as authenticity. I mean, we believe these are characteristics which should apply to any and all archaeological narratives, whether fictional, imagined or otherwise. What Plusianic and uh, Adrian and Mary Pretzelis have in common is a recognition that our use of the past can serve the present um, and its agendas without necessarily imposing itself on the past or colonizing the past. Indeed, we argue it's precisely an element of presentism which allows us to engage ethically with the past. It is our responsibilities in the present which frame and guide our approach, or should. And this ethical archaeological rationale in fact mirrors recent philosophical work uh, which responds to Collingwood's uh, historical empathy. Now the claim that historical empathy, which Dan flagged up in the introduction, um, uh, involves some sort of temporary suspension of the scholar's own uh, historical situation has been thoroughly challenged. It's been argued that in order to suspend one's prejudices so that we can occupy somebody else's position or, or beliefs is a delusion which conceals and therefore leaves unchallenged uh, their continued influence. 
Instead, it has been argued that it is essential to explicitly recognise the historical situation of the scholar, because it is precisely that situated perspective that provides the reference point against which somebody else's uh, understanding of the world can be understood. If we could literally walk in somebody else's shoes without any reference to our own historical situa situation, we would lose any reference point with which to evaluate that perspective, to understand its, its alterity or its similarity. The German philosopher um, Gadamer argues that the scholar's, ask, the scholar's task consists not in covering up this tension by um, uh, covering up this tension by attempting a naive assimilation of the two, but rather in consciously bringing it out. We can and should only empathise through explicit recognition of our own historical situation, what Gadamer refers to as a fusion of horizons. That is the intersection of the horizon from our own historical perspective or situation and the horizon, basically the, 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 the view literally, from the perspective of somebody else. In practical terms, we argue that the ethical and epistemological objections to empathy can be addressed. Further, we argue that it can be useful to use archaeology, uh, empathy and archaeology in order to improve not only understanding of the past, but also the present. We can use empathy as a means of stimulating cultural dissonance in order to understand the actions of people in the past and our own historical situation. Into our final transmogrification, back into Dan. Moral and uh, political philosopher Justin Steinberg uh, argues that there is an epistemic case to be made for, uh, for empathy, even if the resulting insights are not unique. That is, if they could all have been acquired through different means, it, still, um, it, it would still make sense to use empathy. He maintains that empathy yields the information in a uniquely user-friendly way. Um, this might be considered in relation to the calls uh, for the use of fictionalized accounts uh, and empathy in order to better communicate the results of archaeology to, uh, to the wider public. And it explains the centrality of empathy to historical novels, films and TV. The method yields uh, an immediate understanding that does not require laborious thinking. Um, but whilst useful, um, this justification of empathy does seem rather minimalist, and we could do better. There is valid critique of visiting the past as a form of costume drama where we play out in frock coats our own interests, projecting ourselves into the past only to legitimize, criticize, or simply escape the present. Is there any point visiting the past simply to recreate the present? This might all be well and good for novelists and filmmakers, but as archaeologists, any attempt to put ourselves in somebody else's shoes are precisely to, in order to experience alterity as well as similarity. Looking back from the present, it is very difficult not to find ourselves in the past and therefore to write teleological accounts. Our argument is that the use of fiction and empathy are tools which can potentially help us to identify and avoid the presentism of many of the conventional accounts by helping to establish a, a difference and distance rather than just similarity. As we've already seen, both empathy as a concept and historical fiction as a genre uh, can play on uh, whoop, there we go. Um, can play on familiarity, closing the, dis uh, the, the distance between the present and the past, between them and us. But we've also seen that these are not inherent qualities. Empathy does not require complete similarity to work. Indeed, it is the point that through see seeing through different eyes and walking in different shoes. A key part of empathy is therefore a recognition not just of familiarity, but of difference. It offers the pos uh, possibility of cultural dissonance, which can stimulate re-evaluation of both past and present. Operationalizing this is, of course, another matter, and we don't propose any um, simple answers. Uh, obviously, that would be A, too easy, and uh, B, too difficult for us. Um, we do, however, contend that the fictional narratives and empathy are not inherently different from the conventional archaeological narratives, and further, that they do offer additional ways of approaching the evidence. 
Empathy by itself is inadequate as a moral compass in the present and as a way of accessing the past. Empathy embedded within a rational and ethical framework, however, offers a powerful and effective tool. By explicitly recognizing our own historical situation, not ignoring it, we can avoid colonizing the past and use empathy to engage with past people who are different from us. As archaeology rarely deals with individuals, one way of operationalizing this approach is through fictionalized or imagined accounts, which allow us to work through the possibilities, the events which did not take place because different courses of actions were followed, because it, the, the actions simply didn't get um, made their way into the archaeological record or what have you. Our argument is not to replace reason with fantasy, but to make judicious use of imagination and empathy to enrich our current narratives. And um, Goya was friendly enough to, to uh, summarize our position, say, 200 years ago. Um, and on that note, we would like to draw this to a close. <laughs>